Hey, I'm Brett Varvel. You're watching Sunset Friday Live. Don't miss the incredible, life-changing conversations that happen on this incredible show. No, you're you going to bust in the back of our head. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I'm laughing. I'm sorry. <laughs> and that was the last date. <laughs> I, I, I bet it was. People around them posting, booked it. Got it. They, you know, I'm on set, live on set. You know, they're, they're seeing right. the lives of everybody else kind of doing well, their thing. Well, and these are new people. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do you ever see Denzel going booked it? <laughs> <laughs> if Jesus were standing in front of you right now, what would you say to him? Thank you. Thank you. Glory to God for good times, big laughs, the godly life we strive, turn it up for the king right here, on Sunset Friday Live, let's go, hey, Sunset Friday, Sunset hey. Friday, Sunset Friday Live, hey, Sunset Friday, Sunset hey. Friday, Sunset Friday Welcome to Sunset Friday Live. I'm Anthony Hackett. Adana is not here today, but this is your home for Christian life and entertainment, and I'm excited. We got a good guest today. Really excited. Can't wait to talk with him. This is Mark Christopher Lawrence. Uh, we're really fast. Let me just tell you a little bit about this guy real quick before we put him on the screen, okay? So Mark Christopher Lawrence uh, is an actor as well as a stand-up comedian and voiceover artist. Uh, he's known for such roles as movies like Terminator 2, Judgment Day, uh, Tale from the Hood. I remember that joint, man. That was that was that was scary too. Uh, Planet of the Apes, Lost Treasure, The Pursuit of Happiness, um, as well as more recent films um, as such as uh, Family Camp and uh, Bringing Back Christmas. This guy's all over the place, man. He's doing his thing. I mean, this goes on and on. Let's not forget about his TV credits appearing in Martin Murphy Brown, Seinfeld. Third Rock from the Sun. I mean, I just need to stop. It's just, it's too much. Go to his IMDb and look up this brother. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the awesome actor, stand-up comedian, and cool guy himself. This is Mark Christopher Lawrence. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so listen, Mark, uh, before we get into this uh, illustrious career in entertainment that you've uh, been blessed to have, uh, there was a life before that. There was a life before all of that. And uh, I want to talk uh, talk to you just about kind of your your uh, pre-getting into the business, pre-getting into the industry. I read here that you are actually from or grew up in Compton, California. Yes. What was life like growing up in Compton? Well, you know, it's like anybody else's life. You know, it's like I was a kid in Compton. We, we moved there in 69. Uh, we were the second black family on our street. By mm. 74, all the white families had moved out. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's like um, the media makes more of it than, than the reality is. You know, mm. although there, you know, there was gangs, there was uh, drugs and violence, but it wasn't like every single day on your street. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so the media just made it out to be that Compton was this huge hub of of violence and, and drugs and gang activity. And that's not the case. Now, your mom was a single mother uh, from yep. what I from what I've uh, heard. How many siblings do you have? Uh, two, two other siblings. Mom. My father had other kids, but uh, uh, there were three of us in, in my home. Got you. And where do you fall? Oh, oh, this middle youngest. I'm the baby. Oh, the baby. Okay. So was that growing up in a single family home with you being a baby? Were you treated any differently, or were you was you all kind of the same? Kind Absolutely of the same not. Uh, <laughs> every time my mother taught my brother to do something, we all learned it. So at six, I was doing my own laundry. I was cooking my own breakfast. You know. So yeah, there was no no preferential treatment because I was the baby. So when you when you're actually uh, growing up beyond just Compton itself, um, taking a look back at just kind of like your your we call them the formative years, you know, your coming of age years, your teenager, your high school time. Um, what was life like for you? I, I don't even know if you were in California at that time, but if you were, what was life like for you as a teen, um, kind of in your high school years? Well, it it it, it was uh, you know simple back then. I mean, you know, we didn't have we didn't have 
social media and all the things that the kids have now, you know, it's like, um, it, it, it was a situation where, where we actually went outside to play, you know, mm-hmm. you know it was like, uh, we walked to school. There, there was no mom picking us up and taking us every day. You know, <laughs> it, it, it was a different time to live. Um, and then by, by the time I got to high school, I ran into a teacher, Mrs. Schilling, an English teacher who got me involved in speech and put me in my first play and introduced me to a guy who was instrumental in uh, getting me started in comedy. Is I, I started doing comedy in 11th grade. Mm, 11th grade. That's that's Now, that's actually really young um, to start a, a, a situation in comedy, stand-up comedy, I'm assuming, I'm presuming you're talking about. Um, yeah. what actually, before we get to the comedy, cause I want to get to that. My wife and I was just actually talking about, um, uh, growing up and we were talking about how back in the day, you know, you could go out and ride your bike and you leave a house. Mm-hmm. And when you leave a house, literally you would come back three hours later. <laughs> your parents had no idea where you was at. Like it was just, you was just out. And it's like, that doesn't happen at all these days. Like I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even dare allow my kid to just go outside for three hours and then come back later talking about his dinner ready. Is, is that yeah. is that what you find as far as you growing up? Was it the same thing where you had situations where you just leave and not come back and then randomly you're back home? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, like weekends when 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 mom was, you know, not working. You know, her her, her thing was get out of the house. Why are you stay, sitting here looking at me? And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think our generation was probably the last generation that that did that. I mean, we're probably the last generation that went out and stayed out until the streetlights came on. Exactly, exactly. Um, unless your streetlight, we used to go around busting all the streetlights so that they would never come on. <laughs> we <laughs> just stay out. <laughs> um, stand up, listen, so you said you started in 11th grade. Um, yeah. Now, I want to get to your acting career, which we'll do later, but with regard to stand up, that's, that's like, that's a significant art. And I remember it was one time I was with my wife. This is when we were dating. And Mark, we went to this, um, we went to this comedy club, right? <laughs> and so they asked, you know, they dispensed the routine. And then the guy was like, all right, the host was like, all right, anybody want to come up, you know, uh, open mic night? And so I was like, Psh, I got this. I got this. So my baby, my, my, uh, my, my wife, who had the girlfriend at the time, she's like, no, just sit your behind down. Sit your behind down. I was like, no, I got this. I got this. Sit up. Relax. So I go up there. I get the mic, right? completely winging it. I went up there. I just told some joke that I told at church one time. Didn't know you know what I'm saying. Remember, this is a comedy club. People was drunk and everything. People was just smoking and everything. It was just a comedy club. And so I go up there. I tell this joke. Crickets. Like, it was absolutely no laugh. I felt so embarrassed. And I got off the stage. The host was like, now y'all see, this is what happens when you sip a little bit too much before you decide to go do something. <laughs> and so I was like, I don't drink. But he was he was trying to clown me. Long story short, I realized at that moment that stand-up comedy is actually something you have to practice. It's something you have to learn. It's something you have to actually invest yourself in. Tell us from your perspective the difficulties of stand-up comedy, and specifically when you started to, as you continue to grow, what was the difference in what you learned from the time you started to where you're time to grow as you were growing? Well, well, I think the biggest thing is that early on in your in your stand up career, you, you you don't really know how to write for yourself. Mm. And yeah. uh, now, the the way after all these years, you know, it's like when I write, um, I write in my stage voice. You know, so um, the rhythm of it, the way I perform, it's like it's already there in the writing, and. Um, Early on, you don't have that because you don't know what your stage voice is. You're, you're trying to find yourself on stage. And um, after going out on the road with with comics uh, who were who had been doing it for years, you know, you get better and better each time you go out. You know, you learn stuff from from different comics, and um, a lot of comics would would sit and watch my act and give me tips and give me tags to jokes and you know because i was featuring for them i was opening for them so they wanted me to be better at what i did and and Mm. um i I don't i don't know that that still happens today it's like it's like Mm. these young cats are very kind of cutthroat and and 
uh, it, it, it should be, you know, just a giving community. So whenever I have the opportunity, I always uh, help people out. It's like if I see something, I'll write it down, say, hey, uh, maybe think of this. And, you know, I don't force anything on anyone, but but I give them my two cents. Got you. Um, you've been able to do stand up comedy on many different types of platforms um, from, you know, small comedy venues to television um, and major show, major television shows. Um, I recently uh, saw uh, one you did a little while back on um, I think it was Huckabee Huckabee show. Mm -hmm. um, and you actually started off with singing, uh, which was pretty interesting. I didn't even know you could sing. So maybe we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, but with that being said, is what is the difference in your opinion between performing in like a smaller comedy venue versus like a larger venue or even a television uh, type of a platform? What are the differences between those type of performances? Uh, it's in, in small venues. It's easier to connect with the audience. Um, mm. You know, when you can see them sitting right there, you know, you can make eye contact and you can include them. Um, it's 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 not like you're just performing you're actually including them in the experience. Um, when you're working in bigger venues, you know, your closest person might be 10 feet away. Mm -hmm. So it's harder to make that connection. With TV, it's um, e even more difficult to make a connection because like on Huckabee, for example, the camera is right there in front of me and the audience is behind the camera. So you can't even, you can't make any eye contact and you can't pull them in. Wow. So you got to just turn on the show. Yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. That's wild. Um, to uh, the, the, the difference, have you, have you been able to actually perform on, um, or I guess let me just ask you, what is the largest live platform that you've actually got to perform stand-up comedy at? Um, I did a show for Praise Fest Ministries at Rupp Arena with uh, Bill Ingvall, Sinbad, and uh, uh, Henry Cho. Woo. And so that was about 10,000 people. Yikes, yikes. So you shared the stage with those giants in the industry as well. Um, yeah. Did, were you able to actually have any sort of like connection with them, sit and talk with them or, or speak with them backstage or anything like that? Yeah, uh, Sinbad and I connected. Uh, uh, Henry and I talked momentarily, but Sinbad and I became friends, and it, it, it was it was a good experience. That's awesome. Um, would you say there are any challenges being a black person or a black man within the comedy realm specifically um, versus if you weren't black? Um, are, are there opportunities that may not open as as easy or are there more ladders you have to climb? You know, are there any particular struggles or challenges as a black male in the com in the comedy industry, stand-up comedy industry? And no, I don't think so. I think funny is funny. You know, people hire funny. Uh, the biggest challenge I have now is social media. Um, mm. You know, years ago with the resume that I have as an actor, I, that would get me in a club, in any club in America. And now it's all about social media because the clubs have stopped promoting, basically. Mm. And they count on, you know, the comics to come in with their following. And mm. so my challenge now is to get my social media numbers up and get people coming in uh, to follow me based on, you know, my social media. Um, and, and that's 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 proven to be a little challenging. It's like you never know what's going to hit. Although, yeah, um, you know, I have a dry bar special and, and I have clips that have millions of hits. I have uh, one of my clips has 19.1 million hits the last time I looked at it. And, mm. um, but, but it doesn't translate to people following me on my platforms. Right. You know, because it's on the dry bar platform. Um, so my, my, uh, goal is to, you know, as I do podcasts, hopefully pick up a fan or two that hop, hop on to uh, my social media and and come out and see shows when i'm near you that's awesome and where can they find you on social media uh i'm easy to find mark christopher lawrence is you just google it and and you can find me or you can go to my my website mark .com, scroll down to the bottom all my social media bugs are there got you um well you know it's not always uh peaches and cream in the stand-up industry as i mentioned mm -hmm. you know i had my epic failure uh, early on in my life um, do you have any stories to share where you've 
had a horrible performance uh, or just something that didn't go as planned the way you thought it would or wanted it to. If you guys are enjoying this video, please be sure to hit that like button right now. Just take one second and like it because it does genuinely help us out a lot. And of course, be sure to subscribe and follow for more videos just like this. Now let's get back to the interview. Well, uh, years ago, I was doing uh, this comedy competition at this place called Birdland West. And uh, the night of semifinals, I was third on the show, had a great set, made it to finals. But that night, they told the audience, you know, if you come to, to happy hour before the finals, you get into the show for free. Happy hour started at four o'clock. The show started at nine. <laughs> so by the time the comics got there to do the sh to do the show, people were hammered. Oh man! And, <laughs> and so this particular night, I'm eighth on the show. Uh, I believe D.L. Hewley was was hosting the show. Um, a lot of known comics were on the show, and um, Ricky Harris, who I thought was was crazy funny. He uh, was third on the show that night, and about two minutes into his seven-minute act, he went to his best joke and got nothing. Mm. And there was a lady in the audience who uh, she would sit, she would listen to your joke, it would land, you get nothing, and she would laugh at you. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and, and so every comic was just, you know, in this. <laughs> turmoil of people are just so drunk they're not laughing <laughs> you know they're just watching and you can tell when you're doing well because because they're not chattering uh-huh they're just they're just watching the show but then if it wasn't going well you, you would hear the chatter so uh i said to a friend of mine at the time i said i said hey i said i'm in trouble when, when ricky went to <laughs> when, Rick, when ricky went to his best joke so i got up there and i started doing my seven minutes and i i tell a joke it wouldn't get anything. The lady would laugh. I go right to another one, and and I go through my whole seven minutes. And in that seven minutes, I probably did twenty twenty five minutes worth of jokes because, wow. because <laughs> there was no feedback. <laughs> and, and I came off stage. The other comic said, "Boy, you are a pro." <laughs> <laughs> but it was, but it's painful. You know, it's like it's like even though I don't consider it a bomb, but uh, it was still painful. Right. <laughs> Were you always um, a clean comedian, clean joke comedian? Mm -hmm. I started in 11th grade. Gotcha. You know, I, I couldn't, couldn't live in my mother's house and be a dirty comedian. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know, somebody, somebody, somebody from the church would have saw me, Sister Lee, your boy out there doing them filthy jokes. <laughs> you know, somebody would have heard, and, 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 uh, and, then, and then comedy would have took a hiatus. That would have been a wrap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, as as a as a clean comedian, then how do you approach hecklers? Um, if you you know, and I mean, I, I don't know how much heckling you may get within some of the venues that you do since you do clean comedy. But if you ever do get hecklers, how do you approach dealing with them? Well, it's very rare that I get hecklers. Um, uh, mostly, you get people that that are chatty mm. in the audience. Sometimes, like you get somebody who who is you know out. And it's it's about them and not about the show and and uh, I handle them just like anybody else handles them. I, I handle them, <laughs> right? And, and uh, but I'm just I'm just clean when I do it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you've had uh, this this amazing stand up career. Um, I kind of want to transition to now your acting. I, first, before we get directly into the acting, what is that transition? Was was stand up comedy first or was acting first? And then what was the transition between the two? Well, I did my first play in the 10th grade. Mrs. Schilling, uh, the, the English teacher that I told you about, put me in my first play. Okay. And um, I went to USC on a speech scholarship through the USC debate team. Mm. And, you know, in my head, I was going to be a lawyer. Uh, so I was a communication major. And, and I took a, a voice class or speaking and centering, you know, just to make sure I was using my voice correctly while um, I, I was doing my speaking work. And uh, this instructor talked me into auditioning for the Bachelor of Fine Arts Acting Program at USC. I was already a junior because I transferred in. And uh, it's a four-year program. They put me in as a sophomore. And I started working professionally that same year. Got you. So okay. So that, that was when, you know, the acting thing started. One of my debate coaches had a friend who, who was an agent. She came to see me in a play. He brought her to see me in a play. She gave me a card, told me to come 
and talked to her. So I, I went to her office and she signed me and sent me out for my first audition, which was for Hill Street Blues. Mm. And I, I get home and it's on the machine that I had the job before I got back home. So then for the next year, I, I'd go to an audition and rush home and check the machine <laughs> to, to see if I got a job. Then best thing that could ever happen to me, because then I was just like, oh, I'm not going to get them all. And then it uh, it just calmed me down. And now I go in, I do do my audition and I let it go. That's awesome. You know, otherwise, it'll drive you crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. How did well? How do you let that go per se, or quote unquote? Because there's a lot of actors out here who um, go through the same thing as you. They they go on their audition mm -hmm. and they're stressed. You know, they're like waiting by that phone or they're just hoping and praying. How do you deal with that that patience time? Well, it can be important. It's like it's like you know we're not we're not brain surgeons. We're not saving lives in that way. You know what I mean? Although I, I think uh, entertainment has its value in in mental health and it has its value in in, in the the uh, comfort of people's lives, but um, as a performer, you know, you go in and do what you do and control what you can control. The only thing you can control is what you do in the room, mm -hmm. you know. And if they don't choose you, it's not a rejection. They chose something else. Right. Unless you mm -hmm. go in and just you didn't do your work, you weren't prepared, you go in and you fail because of your own preparation. Right. You know, um, I'm always prepared. So so uh, it's easy for me to let it go when I know I can I've gone in there and I've done the very best that I can do. And there's there's nothing else I could have done to 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 make me better. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to let it go. It's just like, OK. Um, I've done all the work. This is what I'm showing you. Either you want this or you want something else. And then I just let it go. You got to, you, you have to be able to turn that switch and let it go. That's true. Um, I think one of the things that, that is, um, a struggle with the whole letting it go part of things is social media. Um, you know, social media right now, like for people in the industry, Mm -hmm. They'll go home, they'll let it go, quote unquote, and then they get on social media and they see people around them posting, booked it, got it, they are, I'm on set, live on set. You know, they're, they're seeing right. the lives of everybody else kind of doing well, their thing. Well, and these are new people. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do you ever see Denzel going, booked it? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But at the same time, Mark, I mean, Denzel... That's a that's a bad comparable because Denzel's Denzel. Like, well, but, I mean, but he what can, I'm saying he's, is, he's not is, gonna, you know, he's a different level. But is, my point is, you know, if you you're brand new and you're showing us that you're brand new, right, right, um, uh, people don't even know what I'm doing until I've done it. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because one, because you don't know what what the fi final product is gonna be. You know, my first my first job on Hill Street Blues, you know, uh, I was I was still at USC, you know, and, and we had a watch party in the in the debate room and uh, it came on and it was so fast that you blinked that you would have missed me. And <laughs> so I stopped telling people what I was doing after that. And and it, it just makes life a little easier. It's like it's like, OK, people are expecting to see you, but you don't know how they're going to edit it. You don't know how it's going to end up. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You don't know if they're going to use your best take. You know, for example, I was, I was on Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith, and one of the scenes where he comes to get the money from me, you know, my best take was the second take. Mm. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, they didn't use my take. <laughs> you you know, thought it was the best take. No, it was. They it used, was. They used, it, it was my best take. Yeah. Okay. But it wasn't necessarily his best take. Ah, oh, I, I, got so, I got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Uh, well, that I mean, that's part of the business too, you know. Um, being able to be part of uh, a, a film or a project as an actor specifically, um, and not knowing exactly how the end result will be. So, with that being said, right. how do you choose your projects? I mean, there. What is your selection process for um, even projects that you seek to audition for, or projects that are brought to your table to offer you? How do you choose that? Um, I don't turn anything down. Period. You know, okay. Anything that comes to me, uh, I do it. Um, and, and I had this conversation with Della Reese. Uh, I um, did an, an episode of Touch by an Angel, and uh, Harlem Nights is, is 
a crazy funny movie. And I talked to Delores about it when I got there. I said, I said, hey, I said, I just watched you for like the 20th time in Harlem Nights. And Della had a church, right? And so I said to her, I said, I said, she says, oh, Lord, they had me cussing like a sailor. I said, I said, yeah, that's what I want to ask you. I said, did you get any pushback from the congregation or from Christians at large because of your language in that, in that show? And she says, baby, let me tell you this. She says, you're asking because you're wondering about picking and choosing parts. She says, look, God won't bring you to something that he doesn't want you to do. Although we have free choice, he brings you somewhere and puts you in situations, possibly because he's trying to reach somebody else. You know, he's, he's using his love and light shining through you to reach this person over here who doesn't know him. She says, so take your job. She says, somebody doesn't understand that that's a character that you're playing, that those aren't hmm. your words, those aren't your feelings, and that's their problem, not yours. And that right. makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and so um, that, coupled with hearing an interview with Sam, Sam Jackson, uh, who I think at the time was struggling with addiction, and he said that he never turned anything down because he didn't want the free time. Absolutely. Um, I worked with uh, the late and great Tommy Ford um, on a film previously. And, Tommy, um, and I, Tommy and I were, were at USC at the same time. We, we were the two, 100% of the black population of the USC Bachelor of Fine Arts acting program for uh, the graduating class of 1988. Wow. He and I are, were like brothers. That is a, that's a, a fun fact. Um, and of course, rest in God, Tommy. Um, yeah. but he, uh, when I work with him, he, I asked him, has there ever been a project you worked on that you were like, oh, why did I do that? <laughs> what they doing? And he was like, absolutely it was. I, it's happened many a time. Um, and so I, you, with you, um, you know, pretty much saying yes to the majority of projects that may come across, has there been a project for you that you worked on and you don't have to say it, but has there been a project you worked on? It's like, Oh, why did I do that? <laughs> it, there's been a couple that that, and it was it, it was more about the people than the project itself. Mm. Um, but the, but it's it's funny. It's like it, it seems to me that sometimes you know when you're doing these lower budget projects, um, like if I came to you and I said, "Hey, I have this low budget film I'm working on. Um, we'd love to have you." Blah 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 blah, and we get you there. You know, as a producer, I'm I'm treating you the best that I can because technically you're doing me a favor. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, so I've been on a couple of projects where I'm doing a favor. You mm -hmm. know, because really it's like it wasn't enough money to make it make sense to do. And then um, and then wasn't treated well. Mm. You know, it's like it's like uh, if you're if you're barely paying me, you should probably be treating me very well. Agree. Yeah. You know what I mean? So so, yeah. so that so that I want to work with you again. Absolutely. Well fed, you know? well taken care of, nice place right. to stay. All and of that. And the flip side and the flip side is is there's been many times where where on some of those films, you know, people uh go above and beyond. Like working on Bringing Back Christmas, it wasn't a huge budget film, but they treated me so well. And, mm. and it made me want to work with them again and again and again. And, and, um, uh, and I think it all starts at the top. It's like the, the producers and the writers, you know, they prayed every day before we started shooting. Yeah. And, and to have, you know, that kind of energy on set was awesome. And, uh, and they still keep in touch and they still, you know, they're praying for me and they're rooting for me. And, you know, they got projects that are coming up that they want me to be a part of. And it's like, it, it's like, it's easy to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for, for, for you young filmmakers out there, uh, treat people well. It'll make them want to work with you. Absolutely. Um, with that, what type of directors do you like to work with? Um, what's the, what's the, the directing style that best works with Mark Christopher Lawrence? Um, I, I like directors that know what they want. And and uh, uh, they don't necessarily have to hold my hand to, for me to get there. Just tell me what you're trying to achieve, and I put my spin on the character to help to help the project get to where it needs to be. Uh, hmm. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, 
Bring Back Christmas, Lisa Arnold uh, was very hands on. And, you know, seeing every scene, she'd come to me and she'd give me a little tweak on a scene. She'd give me a note that gives it a tweak. Um, uh, Fear of a Black Hat, for example, Rusty Cundiff, uh, the, the way he worked, he was just like, hey, um, we have to say these words to move the story, but do what you do. So he gave you that freedom to play. So it was more like a mockumentary. So the, the, he'd come in with a skeleton script and say, the, we got to say these words to move the story. And um, so having somebody trust you enough to give you that freedom, you know, to explore your character and to uh, be funny in the scene and, and know when to give and take is awesome. Um, uh, uh, then there's, there's directors, uh, you know, like Pursuit of Happiness, the director there, Gabriele, he, he told me, he said, you know, I didn't want to hire you. He says, because you were funny. And I, I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was a funny role. He says, but I knew it needed a rewrite. And, and so I'm so glad I hired you because you're bringing stuff to it. That's not there. Mm. Okay. And, and that's, 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 those are the kinds of directors that I like to work with. They know what they want and they get it in different ways. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, do you prefer comedic roles or dramatic roles and I'm, I'm sure obviously you do either one either it's fine but is there a preference or is there one that uh, you find yourself more attracted to i think i'm a stronger dramatic actor than i am a comedic actor but my career has been mostly comedy um the agency that i'm at now they totally get that i can act and i feel like i'm a better dramatic actor because i work harder at the dramatic stuff because you got to dig into your life to find things to help you get to ugliness mm -hmm. you know what i mean things yeah. to help you get, get get to emotional responses that portray what the character is going through what role does your face play in everything that you do whether it's comedy or whether it's acting or or even you know your your just your life in general um what did what role does your faith play in in navigating those areas of your life well, well, faith is is first and foremost in my life. You know, it's like it's like I, I it's like I wake up praying, I go to sleep praying. I, you know, I fall back on prayer throughout the day. Um, sometimes I wake up at three in the morning for no good reason. You know, and and I open my phone, I look at my list, my prayer list, and I go down the list and pray for people by name. Wow. Until I get sleepy again. You know what I mean? Wow. And and so so faith is 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 part of my life. It's not. I, I don't think it. I don't think it dictates the way I work. It's a part of who I am and a part of of what you know. It's like my belief system. Got you. Could I please be added to that prayer list? <laughs> go ahead and drop my Absolutely. name on that bad boy. I'm not joking. I'll put you on there. I will. <laughs> I put me on yours. Absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. So uh, with regard to staying on the track of your faith and, and just that aspect of it, um, what, what has been your, I guess your, not necessarily, I, and I, uh, uh, I guess a brief kind of compact version of this, but your faith journey in knowing God and knowing Christ. I mean, were you, did you grow up and always had a strong relationship or was there a point in your life where that relationship with God actually hit harder than previously? Well, I grew up in the church, you know, it's like, it's like, you couldn't live in my mother's house and now go, you know, okay. so, so I accepted Christ as, as, as my personal savior early in life. And when I went to college, you know, for some reason I decided I don't have to go to church. I'm not living in her house. So, you know, I can still be a Christian and I go to church. And then, you know, some years later, I was just had the feeling that something is missing in my life. Mm. And I knew what it was. It was God because I wasn't going to church and and I wasn't around like minded people often. And um, uh, that's when I decided it's time to get back. And once that happened, you know, it's like it's like I, I, the the weight that came off of me was yeah. immense. You know, it's yeah. like it's like you, you know that that, that verse, you know peace beyond my understanding was there, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I think, um, making that decision to just stop going, 
I think a lot of young people do that. I think because they grew up one way and there's a strict household and they decide, well, I, I'm grown. I ain't got to go to church if I don't want to. And then things start happening in their lives that, that they don't quite know how to handle. And, and I think, uh, for me, you know, once I recognized that, that my life was missing something and I, I was like, okay, I need God back in my life because God is steady. You know, he doesn't leave us. We leave him. Right. You know, God is steady. And uh, that's where I was when when I when I came back. That's awesome. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into what we like to call the appeal in just one second. Uh, but before we do, I just have a couple more quick questions on um, the acting side of things. You've been blessed to work with some very notable people in this industry um, on, on different levels, whether it's you know large or small. You've been able to to be in those circles and in in, in those films. Um, one of the, one of my favorite films that you're, that you're in, um, is Christmas with the Cranks, <laughs> uh, with Tim Allen. Um, if you just take a second, just tell us a little bit about your, uh, memory of your experience working on, on that particular film and working with Tim Allen. Tim Allen is a hoot to work with. I mean, <laughs> he is always joking around on set. Very, very funny, very loose, very relaxed and and just a hoot like we, we were shooting that movie in the city of downey california um in the summer in june i believe it was and it was hot it's like a, you know 103 in downey and i got on a parka and a sweater and i'm <laughs> sweating and, he, and, and he's looking at me sweat and we take he goes he goes hot i said I'm just trying to figure out why you not sweat. He, he said, <laughs> he said, because I cut the back out of my sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Wow. <laughs> and so I'm just, I, it's, so he, he was fun to work with. And, and, um, Jamie Lee Curtis was awesome. The my first day on set, I'm sitting in my trailer with the door open and she just steps up and comes in and gives me a hug and says, Hey, uh, welcome to set. You know, let's have some fun, blah, 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 blah. And just really down to earth. And I told her, I said, I said, um, I said, the last movie uh, horror film that I watched that made me jump was, uh, uh, I believe, it was Halloween with you. I said, I said, yeah. I said, <laughs> I said, and, I said and I told her the story. I said I was on a date. I was, I was in college, and so I'm sitting there, and I look at my watch and put my uh, put my arm around her. <laughs> and as soon as it landed, something having on screen that scared me and I hit her in the back of the head. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and people, people sitting behind us laughed the rest of the movie. <laughs> I told her I, story. She was cracking up. That's what, I thought you was going to go a different route. I thought you was going to say you was going like this and she would jump and fall into your arms. No, <laughs> you going to bust in the back of her head. No. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm laughing. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> And that was the last date. <laughs> I bet it was. Um, who are some, um, who, just looking back at your career and some of the, I guess, more notable talent um, that the general public knows, who's another person or people that you've worked with in some way that was memorable to you, you know, from whatever experience you had with them, whether the conversation or just learning from them or whatever it is, who's someone else notable and why? Um, wow. Uh, Rosalind Cash. I don't know if you remember Rosalind Cash. She um, was in the movie Omega Man. Okay. Way back in the day with Charlton Heston. I worked with her in, in, on a play, Anthony and Cleopatra. And um, she was so down to earth and, and kind of mothering. Because I, I, I was still in college at the time when I was working at Los Angeles State Center. And I would ride my bike to the theater. Mm -hmm. from campus because it's you know i mean by bike it took me like less than 20 minutes to get home and so uh and then i didn't have to pay to park and so <laughs> she she would like make me put my bike in in the back of her car and drive me home every night i was like i was like i was like i can ride my bike home and then we'd sit in front of my apartment and talk you know for hours and we talked about you know her career and things that i'd seen her in like and 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 um you know just picking her brain about the industry and about how, how it's a fickle industry and, and, um, find something else to do that, that, that pays you so that you can eat when you, when it's slow. Yeah. And, um, and 
you know, just those kind of relationships. John Goodman, you know, was also in that play and he and I became friends and John always had something good to say and always had um, uh, 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 some technique tips for me. Bill Cosby said to me, uh, he, he, I was working on Ghost Dad and I'm watching my first seven minute tape from the ice house. I'm mm-hmm. sitting in my dressing room uh, and, and he and he and Sidney Poitier are walking by and he sees it and he steps up on it. He says, how long is it? I said, seven minutes. He says, rewind it. He watched my whole seven minutes. And he said, it's as if you're afraid of the silence. Mm. He says, you're telling so many jokes. He says, you're not giving them a chance to laugh. Mm. He says, if they're not chattering, you got them. He said, wow. let the joke land, let the laughter rise and as it starts to subside don't move or talk until that laughter starts coming down then go and Mm. i went from an opener to a middle act feature act overnight by taking that note because i went from seven minutes to about 25 30 minutes wow i was doing that many jokes in that amount of time i wasn't i was just (laughs) not giving the audience a chance to breathe wow that's awesome, and now man. You can see it. Like like when you when you watch my act, you can see the pause and the go. <laughs> That's dope. I, now I'm now I'm gonna actually intentionally look for that. <laughs> I'm gonna look and see what I the moment I see it. Um yeah. talking to uh, just real quick, if you could talk to two different people. If you can talk to the stand-up comedian, the 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 stand person who wants to be a stand-up comedian and the person who wants to get into this uh, be an actor. Uh, specifically for those two crafts, if you can separate them, what would you say to those people on what they need to do to be able to be consistent in that craft? As a stand-up comedian and as an actor, what do they need to do to be consistent? Uh, as a stand-up comedian, I, I, would, I would tell a, a stand-up comic, write every day. Even if 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 you just have an idea of what a joke can be, write it down because you're not going to remember it tomorrow Mm. and uh, write something every day and get on stage as often as possible. If you can get on stage five nights a week, get on stage five nights a week because that's what makes you better. The actual performance and trying stuff out and, and taking risks with new material. That's, that is what makes you better. Um, as an actor, I would say, uh, don't stop training, mm. you know, keep wow. working on your craft. And, and, and even if that just means, you know, when you're not doing TV or film, you know, get into a play, yeah. you know, because, because that helps you. It's like that, that feeds your, your instrument. It's like, if you look at your body, your, your mind as an instrument, the way you keep it well tuned is to do it yeah and and play that music and and um so i would tell tell you know actors to keep training train every day awesome um christopher lawrence mark christopher lawrence.com uh that's where people can and find out more information about you contact you connect mm-hmm. with you um i i yep. just want to say to you personally um you are for me individually as not just a filmmaker and an actor and, and I'm not a comedian, but I do comedic acting and stuff. Um, you're an inspiration to me, brother. I really, you really are um, watching no, you, you and seeing what you've been able to do and accomplish in this cutthroat industry. Um, and especially as a black man for me too, um, you really are, are motivational and inspirational. So I appreciate you and your words and your time. Um, before we get out of here, um, we're just gonna do the appeal. And it's just sim- okay. three simple questions. You're actually going to give the appeal, but you're going to do it based off of these three questions. All you have to do is answer these three questions for us. All right? Okay. Yeah. All right. First question is, um, share a scripture, verse, or Bible story that holds significance for you and explain why. Um, and this is kind of my motto. It's, it's uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. Mm. Okay. It's short, it's sweet, and it covers you, you know, and it covers everybody. It's like, as I drive around, I'm praying, you know, uh, you know I give my car. It's like, you, it's like, that's, that's one of the few times where there's just quiet to me in the car. 
and I'm praying. I'm praying for people, and I'm praying for for safety, and I'm and, you know praying for our government, praying, praying for everybody. And yeah. and I think I think if we as a nation get back to praying, you know, maybe it'll heal some of the wounds that we have right now. Wow, absolutely. If Jesus were standing in front of you right now, what would you say to him? Thank you. Thank you. Because what he did on the cross, and then three days later, he rose so that we might live. Thank you. Absolutely. And lastly, um, for everything that comes with having a relationship with Christ, why is it still worth it? Because where we are now is temporary. You know, the things that you're going through now are temporary. The persecution that you're feeling now is temporary. The illness that you have right now is temporary. You know, the, the, the bills that are piling up is temporary. But your relationship with Christ is eternal. When we have shuffled off this mortal coil and we're resting in the bosom of the Lord in heaven with our new bodies, our new minds, you know, not needing anything, not wanting anything, just worshiping and enjoying being in the light of the Lord. It's worth it. Beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Christopher Lawrence. Thank you, sir. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Uh, when you work on your next film, think about me. Oh, you mean, since I know you don't say no, are you getting a call? <laughs> <laughs> I got to make sure it's a role that you go. I'm going to create a role where I know you would say no to it just so I can get a first no. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God for good times, big laughs, the godly life we strive, turn it up for the king right here, on Sunset Friday Live, let's go, hey. Sunset Friday, Sunset